Hi, everyone. Hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> Satya, thank you for co-hosting today. It's uh, an amazing pleasure. I'm feeling some good energy around, and I'm just very happy to be with y'all. Even though we are far, I can feel you guys' energy. Very happy and blessed to be here. Yes. <laughs> and Layla is our guest, but first I'm going to introduce Chelio Bourdine so he can start his art piece. Hi, Chelio. Hi, nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for this day. It's very interesting. And uh, we saw what's up about the draw. So Leila, Celio um, is a perception artist who's from Italy and I curated an exhibit called Humanizing the Icon. That's where this show was born um, at the Venice Biennale at the end of 2019. And Celio was one of the artists that showcased there. Um, and we actually had an, an art piece of Tupac that was there. Um, which we'll talk more about. So Chelio transforms the energy of these chats into a live drawing and um, it's really powerful and he shares the message with us at the end, so. I loved that. I read, I think that's why I said yes, because I really, um, I love the energy and what you were doing. I felt like that was Tupac energy, so. Oh, Ooh. yay, <laughs> love that. All right, Chelio, we'll let you get started. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. All right. Till the end. Um, so, okay. So, Satya, we'll start with you because you actually brought Layla to me. Um, and you and I have been collaborating on my Mary Pickford film, which is called uh, Why Not Choose Love? A Mary Pickford Manifesto. Yeah. And tomorrow happens to be the 102nd birthday of the formation of United Artists which to me is not just the marker of independent cinema, but really the birth of independent artistry. Um, and so why did you bring Layla to the show <laughs> on this day at this time? <laughs> well, I, th I guess the, the first answer will be, uh, will be, I guess it was an alignment in itself. You know, as artists, we just follow intuition and instincts. And then afterwards, we understand the meaning of our actions. Um, the first thing is uh, <laughs> the movie Why Not Choose Love that you uh, produced and uh, wrote and directed. Um, you know, first of all, it's unconventional biopic. Mm -hmm. So by being unconventional, we're able to explore and bend the laws a little bit. And, uh, and as we have included other icons uh, that also sort of represents uh, what Mary Pickford represents. Uh, Tupac was also brought up um, because we feel that, you know, Mary Pickford and also even Tupac, there's so much alignment and parallels if we're able to open our mind, actually, which is about to be able to be an independent thinker and also just move forward with your instincts and be able to just sort of break barriers, barriers and just, just be outspoken. And this way, bringing changes, touching people's lives. Um, and, and basically once, you know, Tupac was brought up, Tupac is actually the old, like, you're going to see a unconventional biopic on Mary Pickford. The first voice you actually hear is Tupac's voice. <laughs> yeah. Talking about independent artistry, uh, speak, spelling out so well, and with, a, with an image that I really uh, appreciate, uh, which was actually even, uh, uh, was created by Exalius Devi. Um, and I love how we sing Tupac with eyes closed and just being filled in, in such a, peaceful as if everything is done done my bed and it's just being peaceful and um to me what it made so much sense that Layla <laughs> would know about this project uh i've discovered Layla when obviously why loving the tupac's works uh Layla, you do you and tupac do have a you know and his the journey of you two are definitely interconnected um, and you were there in the very beginning, uh, not when Tupac was already considered an icon, but mostly when I would say, I would like to say that when Tupac felt the icon inside of him, maybe already, but was not yet for the world. <laughs> and, and you two met and recognized each other. Uh, I would even say that he recognized and you 
also the gift that, that you are and what you could bring into the table as well, perhaps even before that you had the confidence in this team, perhaps uh, to accomplish what was accomplished. Um, and when I discovered your journey and YouTube's journey, I was like, wow, okay, well, this is totally aligned. And humanizing the icon is, is exactly about that, is about humanizing the icon. You know, the, uh, it's, it's beyond just, you know, the icon and how we look at the icon, but also all the inner journey. And I would even say the complexity of the human being uh, that then, you know, people will say, oh, this is an icon. But there's also just so much more that makes an icon. And I feel that you were, uh, we, you were there during, we could say, <laughs> part of the genesis. <laughs> let's well. like, yeah, let's, let's have her share. I'm so grateful to have you here, Layla. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I, um, I appreciated that. I appreciate the project that you did and the parallel. Um, and yes, those of us that knew Pac, um, before the world knew him, knew the world was going to know him. He, um, he had it in him. We all saw it. And I definitely didn't know my participation. So that was his doing. He definitely saw in me um, skills that I, I, I didn't want to know I had. I've never been interested in business or management. But um, yeah, he saw it, held me to it, and here we are all these years later and still talking about Tupac because of his heart and his fight. And so I appreciate it. So that's why I'm here with you guys. So on that note, thank you. Um, how would you articulate what you mean by his heart and his fight in your words? And what was that initial kind of, kind of kindred spirited connection you two had? Was it as artists or? Um, I would say that our hearts connected us. We both shared the kind of pain that drives you to make a difference. And not everybody is um, born and wonders what the hell they're doing here or knows that they have a calling and daily has a dialogue inside of themselves that has to do with what am I here to do? What's my service? How can I make a difference? And lots more people don't um, consider what's wrong with family, community, society, the world. And Tupac and I both shared parents who were committed to social justice. We shared parents who were artists um, and that had a consciousness during the 60s and a commitment to make a difference. So we were born with responsibility and not all of our friends shared that. And I think that at the time I met Tupac, the fact that we both shared this history in different ways, different struggles, different challenges. But at the core of the way we were both brought up was social justice is um, as important as family. And that as individuals, we love our family, but we, um, we had this obligation. And I say we because this is my life, and I met Tupac and looked in the mirror. And it was like finding my spiritual mate. And to have somebody that wanted to impact the world, and that was the leading um, desire in his heart was to see people okay and to see suffering stop and to see people heal and to tell the truth about race in this country and colonization and you know we um when we understand a calling, it is in ourselves. And so Tupac had that. And we can deconstruct and talk about his upbringing and who raised him and all of that. But 
at the point I met him, he um, illuminated this heart that I'm talking about. And I had the same thing in me. Whatever um, my issues as a child were, translated into, I want to make the world a better place. I don't want children to be without parents. My mom left when I was young. Brilliant, beautiful woman, artist. And my father was a more responsible parent and she was very committed to community. So um, anyway, we shared issues with our parents and a need to make the world a better place. And so our hearts connected us and we were some kids. I actually thought I was so damn old that when I look back and think, oh my God, I was 25 years old with kids on a path that no one I knew in this life had ever done. So nobody to mentor me or show me how to do it. And um, yeah, that brought us together. And we were dumb enough to think we could change the world. Like it was so tangible. We would sit and have these meetings and hang out and write in the living room. And we thought we could get to the White House and paint it black, like um, <laughs> read song. And, and that was um, the journey we embarked on and life happens and you become what you want to save and it gets complicated. But the intention of our small group of artists was to make our imprint on society and actually have some tangible things that we left behind almost as a letter to future generations. And that's how we came together. And where were you geographically? In Northern California. Okay. Um, Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I'm from LA, but my mom moved to the Bay when I was young and she was living in Sonoma County. And when I became a mother, I wanted to live close to my mom, have her help me with the kids and let her um, make up for her absence by being present with her grandchildren. So that's how I ended up there. And Tupac ended up coming from Baltimore and landed in Marin City, which was 20 miles from where I live. So that's where we were. Were you a poet at that time? I have always written. I um, found journaling in elementary school. I love to write. Me too. I, Me too. I think I bought my first poetry book when I was in sixth grade. I loved the way words jumped out on paper. When I, um, I started buying 45s in third grade. So my first 45 I bought was Marvin Gaye. Beautiful. Um, I got Marvin Gaye, Joe Tex, I gotcha. Um, I got a whole little list, smiling faces. So I came home from elementary school. We used to go to um, a store on La Cienega and buy 45s. And music was everything. I understood the Vietnam War. I understood why my mother was protesting. Music spoke to me and I understood through the stories of those on the front lines fighting for an unjust war. And then my mom would take me to um, marches. My dad would drag all of us to Legion Park. So I really got a chance to see the power of organizing artists and crowds and how you could translate messages. And I felt it and I wanted to organize groups of people around causes. By seventh grade, I think I was already organizing people around music. I somehow, I danced, I was in every play, I was in anything to do with art, bringing people together and talking about issues. And by the time I met Tupac, it was really, I had really advanced um, those ideas. And he had been doing the same thing. So um, he was a young man that was, um, an icon already inside of his own mind and inside of all of our minds. And 
as he became the icon to the world, I um, held on to the man because I understand what that kind of power and attention does to a person. And even before we were all consumed by it, I saw it, but I didn't have enough experience to interrupt it. So, you know, when I look back and I even look at my writings from those days, cause I've kept journals my whole life. And I really, um, in real time was struggling with all of the issues, everything from photographs to who we had in videos to how we greeted the public. I literally could see the rise and the fall happening simultaneously. And I didn't have tools then. I didn't understand um, how to prevent what society does to the people that we iconize. Is that a word? I I, I, I use we that. use it exactly. <laughs> hey, Satya, do you want to take your headset off? Would you mind? Uh, oh well, hopefully I'll be able to hear very well. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, is there a re is is it messed up with the sound or something like that? We hear every, I hear every little like breath and. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll press a little mute. <laughs> no, you don't have to, no, don't mute. No, don't, then you can't convert. When I'll speak, I'll unmute myself. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's okay, it's okay. I just All thought right. if you don't need it, it would, it would be. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, Iconize, yeah. The rise and fall is really an interesting concept and you were catching on to that um, in real time, you're saying. I was living it. I was living it um in in a desperation that's hard to explain and the thing with me is that my father uh grew up in los angeles and was from south central and before the bloods and the crips in los angeles were the slossons and the gladiators and they were two organizations mm. um they evolved into what we know as Bloods and Crips. But back then, um, they were organizing, cause-related organizing. Uh, my dad was probably one of the only white kids that hung out with the Slauson. And they affiliated themselves with the beginning of the Panthers. They had political agendas, economic agendas, but they were in the street. But as a kid, my dad hung out with this group of kids and was arrested multiple times but his parents got him private attorneys and his friends that he grew up with got in a lot of trouble because they didn't have the support my dad had and so my dad was very affected by what he witnessed as a kid in the 50s and so my dad became one of the, um, he, when my dad met my mom, my mom came from Mexico when she was nine. And so they went to high school in LA, got married really young, had me, and my mom helped put my dad through law school. So he became the youngest public defender in the criminal courts in Los Angeles at the time. Wow. wow. And so I was raised going with my dad to court all the time. I knew all the judges. I was supposed to do homework in the back of courtrooms. And, you know, that's Herbie and his, his kid. And so um, I say that to say I'm a lawyer's child. And I understood laws very young. My dad always, um, he would test us. I'd go in a room. How many people were in the room? What color do they have on? How many women? How many men? What did the room look like? And he was always training me to have an awareness that I had no clue would serve me these years later when I ended up in this industry. You're like becoming like a sociologist. Like you could like... I mean, and I went to, in college, I was in behavioral science and, and ended up studying things that would also impact my early knowledge. But my dad, because he had been in trouble, because he got his shit together and then defended um, criminals in Los Angeles, he um, taught me that white people's crimes are different than black people's the percentage of black crimes that he defended were based on economics and struggle 
um, white crimes were different, that race had everything to do with crime and everything to do with the system and we warehouse black and brown people. And so I knew too much too young and paid attention all the time. And then I um, translated a lot of that into my work. And then I also was a daughter in need of a mother who wasn't available. So I had this need to um, mother yeah I myself i mothered my mother and everybody around me and i mothered with an understanding of law and consequence so i was always stressed out around illegal activity i never wanted anyone i loved to see the inside of cells because i knew how um dire it was once system got its clutches on you and I worked surrounded by crime because we could not have a hip hop industry without accepting money from people in the streets because we weren't even acknowledged as an art form. And since the art form was born out of pain and struggle and birthed by mostly young black men initially, uh, black women too, but it was really the voice of young black men screaming out that shit has to change and this is what's really going on. And so I felt almost like a defense attorney in my relationship to hip hop music. I felt like we finally had an opportunity to have black ownership where there was black creation, but there was no way to get support and funding because of that. And so the reality was that drug money funded hip hop in the yeah. beginning. Everyone knows it. And so for me, um, it doesn't matter where and how I participate. If you have knowledge of how something comes, you condone it. And so I always struggled with myself because I, don't want to be outside of the law in any way because I know consequence and you can turn your cheek or whatever it is. But the fact is I knew the sources of support on the ground level. And even if I don't participate, um, I'm culpable on, in some level. And so I always felt that there would be repercussions on some level for our early days, but I was willing to deal with repercussions because this was a fight for people's lives. Um, but I don't think we can talk about the early days of hip hop without talking about the level of substance, um, that drugs had to be sold for the early people on the ground, that people got in trouble, that the violence that erupted as a result of those days was very real that it consumes you because when you're screaming about this struggle, the energy and the fire of it, um, you're also giving a voice to what's going on in the streets. And so the streets were amplified. There's a fight for territory um, and power and geography. And, and so then you have to look at the behavior of colonizers and this country and the struggle and fight out of it but you become on every level in that fight affected by what you're running from and yeah. wanting to change it's it feel it sounds very it's very primal like there's something very like innate and embedded don't you think in humanity um that's being expressed in what in what you're talking about Um, I didn't know what you meant by that, but <laughs> the fight for territory. You talk about colonizing. Like oh, it, it sounds very primal. It, it goes back to caveman. It goes back to jungle territory. There's something very like primal, um, just in the way you expressed it, even elementally talking about the fire, you know? So I wondered like, do you think of it that way like since since humanizing the icon is like this deconstruction of this is hip-hop culture and then do you also because you seem so um psychologically and, and socially attuned when you zoom out and look at the bigger picture do you see what you're talking about in the dna of humans or is it something uber specific 
to this culture in well, your through your well, life? Very specifically, um, Tupac's role as a man fighting for change before there was a Black Lives Matter hashtag, mm -hmm. there was Tupac. And Tupac's single focused commitment was to make Black Lives Matter globally um, and to head on address systemic racism mm -hmm. and the outcry and the effects and the impact of racism uh, an artist friend of ours said slavery was not abolished it was polished by the prison industry his name is shane um those are his lyrics but that was our work to abolish the industry profiting off of caging black and brown people it so reminds me of uh Sorry to say, just uh, it reminds me of a line of Tupac said, I, I think he said it in an interview, and it's following exactly what you're saying, when he said that, he said, well, when, when he was saying, when I see young, young white kids from uh, neighbor suburbs listening to my music, coming into the concert and relating to the message, he was saying that I know that they will grow up to be the ones that will may probably hire my people who, were, who will make use their perhaps so-called privilege to make changes for my people because they will relate and feel sure, it. And you brought it full circle. So that's exactly what I was gonna say is, Tupac, as an artist, had a battle cry. And his battle cry was to bring all people to the understanding that it is a reality that Black lives have not mattered. And here is the, the thesis and here is the evidence and in his battle cry he wanted to organize everybody through his song to internalize this pain and fight for the change he was an inclusive artist with a very clear message we make no mistake about it his fight was for black lives and the fight for black lives lies on all of us. So it's not as a black man fighting for black lives, it's a black man in his battle cry asking you to understand why this fight is so necessary and must be a priority for all of us to be honest and tell the truth. And his pain spoke such volumes he cut through. For the first time, white kids began to understand what it means to colonize a people, a nation. For the first time, white kids were like, damn, they're really warehousing black and brown people like that? And we began to do programs in all the schools, the juvenile halls, and the prisons, and to bring artists and law students and social workers into the institutions so that they could be on the front lines in their work so that we could start to see these shifts. So when I say, um, if you walk into Warner Brothers Records now and you see almost every department head in the entire company, a person of color or a woman, Tupac started that movement. Tupac's voice had everything to do with the shift that's happening now. And the sad thing is that he can't be here to witness the impact he had on policy and procedure. So in what I was at, bring it back to law. I started this conversation and I was talking about the impact of having a father who's a lawyer. The other part of having a father that's a lawyer, in addition to always being protective and the mother and don't get in trouble and running behind and freaking out about anything that has to do with law, the other part of that is that lawyers are word workers and so they understand that things change when you can write when you can change policy and procedure because you can articulate the language you understand it and you can affect it so the plan was that tupac through his art would mobilize the people and i would work with law students the system and i would organize the educational pieces on the ground that could help shift the narrative. 
So I always thought that we were gonna do it together physically, but now all these years later, I've been working with Professor Armour at USC Law in partnership with the law department and doing the same workshop I did with artists, with law students. Um, and I've watched for 12 years, his law students transform our country in, in real ways, in real time. And um, Tupac's lyrics and his words have impacted an entire generation all over the globe. So, you know, Tupac sent me to you to have this conversation. And I feel like I have been on this almost 25 year journey without him sitting next to me, but we're partners in the work. He's with me more than he ever has been. And it is heartbreaking that this man could not see himself living to enjoy the work and to be present and actually be in his body and love this life. And that's the other painful thing that we have to think of in terms of our lesson from it is that we absolutely stress ourselves into disease and see ourselves into harmony. In his script, he could never see being here past 25. And that it, it was encoded in him because in his mind, he, he accepted it, embraced it, knew living as a young black man, he always felt endangered and knew his days were numbered, that his voice couldn't be as powerful and resonate if he was here. And so that's heartbreaking. And he knew that at 17. At 17, he called it, he told us. And so it's hard for all of us that share responsibility that knew him as the man and watched him become an icon. And, and as we fought for this man, we lost him. And so, yeah, I know I ramble. Well, Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. What I'm here a, just like listening. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> what, um, you, when you first sat down, you said, um, I don't even know why I agreed to do this conversation. <laughs> and I'm so busy, right? This is like real talk. Um, you said, but I think it was the title. Um, so what about the title and what do those words mean to you? Because I feel like it's such a personal thing, humanizing an icon. Because it fucking pisses me off. Sorry. Can I cuss on here? Yes. Um, Absolutely. This I, is hip hop. <laughs> I, um, lately I've watched some of these documentaries on Netflix. What is it? The Nexium documentary and the Epstein documentary. So we guru people and we pedestal people yeah. and some people's intentions are so beautiful and others are not, but it bothers me that we iconize people yeah. and Tupac made fun of it. And if you really study his last album and he, um, he does a lot with religious symbolism. You know, he sees himself as Jesus to feed the people, but he also laughs at himself in the same breath. And if you know him and his Gemini self, he um, positioned himself and laughed at himself in the same breath. And he laughed at people's weakness and in a loving way, but he wanted to send people to themselves he um, really felt that he was raised Muslim. He explored Christianity and read every spiritual book you could imagine and came to the understanding, like many of us, that we meet God inside of ourselves. And when we collectively have that meeting, then we all know that all religions are related and we all want to understand love and have that connection. And that religion is organized to control the masses, but spirituality belongs to us all. And it was important to him to explore 
our ideas around religion and blasphemy and yeah. what we do um, under the name of religion. And so he explored corruption in the church and hypocrisy and the love of God and the need and the sadness that Jesus was a man who loved his freaking people. And we had to iconize him and kill him. That's it. So Tupac felt that the more they put him on the pedestal, the closer he would be to an early death. And he was willing to be and do whatever he had to if he could change and turn the light bulb on in people's hearts. And so he sacrificed himself in that way. And I can say that he sacrificed himself because I witnessed it. And it was conscious. It was not unconscious. He um, was truly willing to not be in body anymore if he could transform the generation. And that was really hard to witness. It was hard to be in a room and hear somebody that was younger than me look me in the eyes and say, appreciate me now because I won't be here, but keep the work going. You got a promise. You will always do this. And I wonder sometimes what I'm still doing, running around. Kids call me all hours of the night like I'm the perpetual committed um, to mothering and parenting our generation because they need it. They're broken and we're all broken. And um, a broken heart is open and it's open to have love. And sometimes we need to break and have that hurt to grow out of that. And he understood that too. So what I was saying is I liked that we wanted to talk about the man um, that didn't get to be because of what we do to those that have incredible gifts. And it's very seductive. Artists, athletes, people who get lots of attention, we want to eat them alive. We tear them up. We want them. And we can never have them. And those that are committed to the people, like Tupac, like me, like anyone who spends as much time Giving, we're very difficult to have a relationship with. It takes somebody that really understands that they have to share you with the world. And that's not for everyone. But when, um, when you have to draw that line or make the choice, Tupac will always choose the people. He, if, if something was calling that was cause related or if he's needed, Everybody else would be sitting at home. He's going, and he was called in that way. And I'm called in that way, too, so I understand that. And it is not for everyone. It's something you can't walk away from. And it is a burden and a choice um, on some level. And so he went with his calling. We can resist it. Some people know they have a calling. They feel it, but they don't. Um, indulge in it they make choices not to to do what they're called to do and some people live miserable lives they're never happy because they do what they think they're supposed to do so um it is on us when we're called to answer that calling and i, I said in the beginning that some of us from the youngest that we can remember like i talked to tupac when we were first hanging out and he said as long as he could remember he always asked himself, like, why am I here? Why was I born? What is this? And I said, me too. I thought when I was young that everybody asked that. And I learned that that's not the case, that some people are really happy to just live, have an insular life with their family, work, be okay. And that is beautiful. We need that. Um, and other people live every day wondering how they can contribute, how they can make the planet better, how we can heal society, how we can collectively connect with God and make these shifts. And, and that was definitely Tupac. Yeah, that's oh. really, really, really well said. No, it just, I was getting super excited while you were talking because um, it was a very like psychic connection I was like feeling I just had this conversation yesterday which I've had numerous times in different forms and I'm sure with 
with Satya probably directly about the heartbeat of all these religions that have become institutionalized that that are institutions um being universal love like at the core that's that's what it is and mary pickford who um uh, the more you talk about Tupac, the more I'm just like, whoa, we are really onto something. I hear like the parallels completely. And I'm like, just like, whoa, silently <laughs> listening. <laughs> I was just telling someone yesterday how Pickford and like myself, you know, explored every religion, was into Eastern philosophy, was into, she looked into Christian science and Buddhism and this and that. And she ended up writing this book called Why Not Try God after she was out of the limelight which again, she didn't pass away in physical form, mm. but she was, she was killed basically as an artist, um, being the very first you know, cinematic icon. And after she was out of the limelight, she wrote this book called Why Not Try God, but she um, was talking about universal love, which is why the movie is called Why Not Choose Love. And it was about this like creative frequency that's like the highest frequency. Um, and I was, I was just blown away to discover that that's where she birthed Hollywood, you know, from, which is like a storytelling field, you know, and founded United Artists as this uh, philosophy of like banding artists together to bring forth these messages that you're actually talking about. And she transcended age, ethnicity, and gender in, in the roles that she played over 100 years ago, feeling it was important that we're enslaved to this like, these belief structures, you know, that we have to break free of. And her and Tupac would have definitely been friends. Absolutely. And I can see like, how they brought us together. It, like, makes me emotional. That's it. You have, like, two two different icons just bringing us together, right? And, and it feels that, you know, as you – I really like so many things you've said, Layla, that really, oh, like, was touching. So powerful. So like, powerful. super powerful. Like, whoa. And uh, there's a sentence you, uh, you started saying, and uh, it's like you said um, – you know, you feel painful for, for uh, the man who didn't get to be, and uh, you didn't really finish the sentence, but I see you're going to go by saying for the icon to be, in a way. Um, and That's what I was going to say. I'm sorry? That... <laughs> We're completing yeah. each other's sentences. It's so heartbreaking. It's so hard. And it's like this thing of, uh, um, you know, for me, like, exper- you know, Talk about a kid growing up in Montreal, Canada. <laughs> you know, uh, growing up in a, in a in a suburb, and I'm just getting in touch with uh, Tupac's artistry. And for me, for example, when I was even before I gained like really consciousness listening to Tupac, I remember for me it was I you know other artists that was passing through the radio. I felt like it was you know it was music you know music passing by, and then when it was a Tupac song, it just felt like someone was in my room just speaking to me <laughs> directly. I could feel the energy, it was. And, you know, and then at some point, uh, what happened is just, I just started, you know, I just started listening only to Tupac. I had a phase just only Tupac because only then that I re- actually feel like there's a connection there. It's just not just background music. This thing cannot be background music. <laughs> what was that line that he's that we use in the film, um, Satya? Do you remember that Tupac says? I think in an interview about it's not just Mexican kids or Korean kids or white kids. Do you know this? Do you remember this line? I cannot quote it well for this one, um, but you know, it's so it's so much about this unification. Absolutely. Uh, because it's, a, you know, what, what's interesting with, uh, with Pac is understanding that, and also was the same for Mary Pickford, is, is this thing of understanding that, you know, it's, you have to take a holistic approach to fix a problem. It's, you know, if, you, if for example, women are fighting for, you know, uh, let's say equality and all of that, it also takes the men to join in and understand the whole thing. It has to be like a holistic approach. And he said, he said, we've been slacking. He said that. Absolutely. He's talking about everyone, all of us, right? We've everyone, you know, everyone is slacking. And it's, oh, uh, he says, you, he says, nobody was born independent. 
you have to learn like this learn. idea of like you're born it you're born enslaved to these systems and these belief structures you got to learn how to be independent and i and i love that yeah go ahead layla you know i was gonna say um just in response to what you were saying i definitely in my time with tupac and ray love and the circle that was around us um in those days i um grew up like everybody hearing people tell me to value myself and have self-worth and self-esteem and love yourself what the fuck love yourself and so conceptually what does that look like and you know we all think we love ourselves but what is it truly to love oneself and so for me what i began to really understand is the only way one learns to love oneself is by the love of another teaching us what that is um so we learn our value by being valued we learn to love inside based on that connection first that comes outside and then as we are sent back inside often from hurt or pain from loving and connection we begin to find those things we look outside for inside mm -hmm. but that doesn't happen in a vacuum it doesn't happen until we've stretched ourselves to connect with another till somebody mirrors for us our beauty our value our worthiness and so i never send kids off to go love themselves or to find themselves or you know, you've got to love yourself. I love them until they find it in themselves to do the same. And that's how we have to teach relationship and worth and value is by showing up for people and doing those things because we only exist in relationship. And then um, when we address all these things and then we are able to have honest conversations about inequity and race and trauma and all this stuff that we're all carrying inside then we can actually release it and look at the fact that you know last life i might have been korean the life before that maybe african maybe next one i'll be from portugal but we will stop thinking of ourselves in this linear way and we will understand that we may continue to rotate but that we are much more than our body in this time period. But we're not there yet as a consciousness. There are people evolved enough to tap into source. There are people who die physically and come back in the same light, life, and they saw that light or whatever it is that, um, that let them know that we are more than just body. But there are many who haven't evolved to that place yet, and they really want to run around and rock confederate flags and storm the capital and they're still holding on to these old ideas of things that were never theirs and you know those lessons are coming we don't have 30 50 years to get a karmic lesson anymore things are coming fast there is a virus so that we all learn to reset our immune systems mm. we're um being taught to address our biology, our healing, our health. Some people will get a vaccine, others won't. But in our minds and our programming, that will have a lot more um, to do with our outcome than anything else. And that's the territory that an Elon Musk should invest in. He should be thinking, wow, let me put half of what I put in chips into the territory and capacity of what thought does to the brain. And we might not need the chip. We might be able to learn about the possibilities that exist within our humanity, our brain and our biology. Oh, beautiful. That exactly. we can begin to do those things without those needs. But meanwhile, the plant medicines are um, traveling all over the world now yeah people are tuning in to the plants that have been here for millennia that have been used by native peoples from the beginning of time um and so whatever is needed right now on the planet it's coming fast because we are changing consciousness 
at light speed. And so that's why I talked about that app because what I see happening on Clubhouse is the first app that I've seen that, at, at serious though, it, that has <laughs> potential to hold this kind of a conversation that can push us along. I mean, I've seen these conversations that no one's wanted to have, people are afraid to have, that deal with what's going on in our country right now, that addresses what it means to be a comrade, an ally, a supporter of, just causes and things that need to happen. And so I think Tupac would have been all over that, screaming on this soapbox, organizing people, because we have an opportunity now to do that. I think those people should pay me because I just gave them a commercial. We might need to- <laughs> I think like, I think you're, I mean, I love this. So you're talking about like quantum mechanics. And exactly. So many things we could go all day. I, we're so like, we're all like so telepathically linked right now. I'm like, my mind is blown. I love it. Well, I, I think Tupac and I were going to explore, um, those areas a lot more. We did some together and, you know, I, um, I was blessed enough to meet Ron Doss in my youth and a lot of the people love him. Oh. Um, doing the work in the sixties. I had really good friends that exposed me to amazing practices, but then again, race always comes up for me because so many of the spiritual practices and access to teachings, were limited to white people. And I would go to spaces and it was only privileged people that, you know, it's a luxury to contemplate social change. When you're fucking trying to survive and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, how can you ponder like, oh, but Tupac could and he did. But for the most part, the majority of people struggling, we keep people struggling so they don't have access to this information. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me so much that I rejected a lot of our spiritual teachers because they didn't make it a point to extend the teachings to include everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's something we have to look at. We don't get to be passive about it anymore. Anywhere, any field, anything we're doing, it's our responsibility to look at the board members of companies, the makeup of companies, the participants, all of us on this journey are being required and asked to step up and address things. And it doesn't have to be done in a shitty way, but respectfully, it's time for these changes. And I feel like that's what Pac and I came together to do was to really, um, incite our youth to be a generation that that would be accountable to this shit. I, yeah, I would say you're representing these messages incredibly beautifully. And I really mean that, like, what a, what a journey, you know, what a journey, uh, right? Like, absolutely. this life, man, is a trip. <laughs> Thing. And it's a spiral and it keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It's, uh, I mean, look at us, the four of <laughs> us. I mean, Satya, you're in Montreal, incredible artist and healer. Layla's here, we've heard her incredible story. Chelio from Italy is like ch transforming our energy. And I'm like, here on behalf of United Artists, like, <laughs> this is amazing. I am so grateful for the coming together of you beautiful people. Thank you. Honestly. Blessings. Really. really <laughs> Thank I, you. I always talk to him. I'm like, he sent me on so many amazing journeys in my life and so much pain, you know. I, um, I couldn't immerse myself in this struggle and not have um, casualties and, and costs that I don't think I ever even thought that I would have to participate. I didn't imagine when I had black children, the terror I would have to go through every time my son walked out the door at six feet in racist Santa Monica. And 
that my stepson who I helped raise would be killed by the Oakland police and spark one of the biggest outcries in the Bay Area of an unjust killing. Um, so I have lived um, the struggles and the pains that I never imagined would be visited on me. And so I, um, I can't imagine what black women especially have endured in this country for so long. And because of my children, because of my father's work, because of my family, I have to share an experience that I had a choice not to. And the choice is the problem. And I actually had a choice. I moved from South Central to Santa Monica. I went from poverty to extreme privilege and was surrounded by a lot of money and lots of people with money when I was young that really liked me. I had a choice to go be unconscious and live comfortable. How strange is that when you contemplate that and you um, actually have people telling you that you have a choice and what are you doing? Yeah. So um, inside, I didn't have a choice, but the fact that I actually had a choice and my paleness gave me access that none of my friends had and that that was really in my consciousness was crazy to me and so like my father i spent you know my i'll be 60 this year so my entire life has been um a commitment to make these changes and live them and so in doing so i never imagined what um would come to pass with my family so that I would really have to understand the pain and the tragedy and the trauma that we live. And so I am here still doing the work. Anytime I can be in a space where I can share, if somebody um, wants to talk about something with content and depth and substance, I feel this feeling and I'm called to do it. And I don't do that many interviews. I really hate it. I'm always nervous and I pretend I'm not, and I'm uncomfortable, you know, I'm going to be 60. Who wants to have to see themselves on a damn camera? It's <laughs> awkward. And so that's why I said, at least let me blow dry my hair. And <laughs> I feel like... You did a lot more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, I could, yeah, I could hang out for a day. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I'm loving this art. Oh my gosh, the strangest thing. Leo, tell us what you've got what you've got for us. Yeah. If I showed you my tattoos, it would be really crazy to see <laughs> um piece of art. Chelio, are you gonna um come in and tell us your messages? Hey, Hi. I'm here. Okay. So uh Leila is uh, all this conversation it's uh, inside of you you uh you look uh, this is you and then you look at the past uh, you are the composition of your past but your your personality is uh, coming from the people can uh, like your parents your family before for generation because give you a very sweet, lovely education, open to into the world, and then we have some uh, the scale of your uh, generation before. Is this grandmother, mother? Is you? You look and then you say thank you for give me this love, and then you hug a black community is uh, i don't know is to pack or not to pack but it's a black community because you are thinking about this very deep very soul in this uh, in this conversation i perceive this we have some little sweet animal like lamb very pure like in the religions but this hug you because no he can believe in you he, uh, he believe in your love and then you spend your life about your beautiful education 
then you hack a black community. We have uh, some black people inside everywhere. And yeah, and we have this beautiful soul. And so what I perceive today, I don't know the story of Tupac because I'm Italian. I have uh, inside of me, I have other story, but I feel your energy and your soul pure and your dedication to fight for give a free a word and the same. Uh, your story, you watch in the past, you hug a black community and the pure people, pure person, pure souls hug you because you are okay. This oh. is my point of view. Wow, that's amazing. Can I get a copy of that? I will get that to you. And did you say your t are your tattoos like resonant with this? I can't lift my shirt up, but it's kind of wild if you see. I'll send you a picture later, not not for the um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. people. <laughs> but, but I, yeah, I have a massive story across my body, and I never was um, supportive of tattoos. I was super critical. Um, especially you know back to that law thing it's always how they identify young people I, I just um had something in me but anyway i have a tattoo story and it's definitely a tupac related story so i do have a tattoo it's not tupac at all but when i show it to you and you see that picture that he drew it's very wild and whoa i can't wait okay we're gonna i'm gonna get on Thank that you. Thank and I you. love this. Oh like you're, it's like you're protected by this pure energy. This so, damn, it's really. So you know Bernini, the artist. Yes, yes, Bernini. Yes. Bernini inspired the tattoo across me. We um, have connection, Italian connection. <laughs> it's just crazy that you're on here. I have to send this. Let me see how I can send it to you. Well, I'll, I'll end the live so we can um, say goodbye to our our people. <laughs> And uh, bye, people. I and hope we can share good. tattoos. <laughs> 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 All right, this will be on our YouTube channel, Humanizing the Icon. And um, this was so powerful. Lynn. I Thank hope you. it was okay, you know. You were amazing. So this was so much, it was so much fun and so important. So, thanks. yeah, yeah, you dropped jewels, uh, just yeah. gems. It's uh, was very listenable, uh, very potent, full of substance. <laughs> It was a it was a heal it was healing in itself to just to, to listen to everything. You speak from the heart and it's felt and that's where that's how the healing goes. And I I'm looking forward to people listening to this conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, and artists unite, everyone. Tell your stories, whether you identify as an artist or not. It's really important to uh, honor your narrative and use your voice. Absolutely. To believe in a, in a the inner icon, if I could say it this way, yeah. everybody has something. Yeah, everybody has something to bring, and by bringing it out with full authenticity, that's when it reaches to people. That's how it is. That's how it's get created. Thank you. Lots Blessings. Of love. Okay, I'm signing us off of Facebook. Ciao, people. Yeah, oh, bye, bye, everyone. <laughs> All right, so we but we're are... still here at the after party. Yeah, we're, at the after. <laughs> we're not got our after party, baby. <laughs>